Hi everyone. I think we can start. I had to send a lot of uh, links again because apparently many of you hadn't received uh, the link or the link had uh, sort of uh, disappeared uh, in uh, the spam folder. Anyway, um, good evening, good afternoon and good morning to everyone and welcome to all of you and thank you of course to our DJ Christian Guiducci who offered his uh, <laughs> music compilation. My name is um, Gabriella Susanne Van Zahn and I'm board member of uh, Fit Europe and together with uh, Annette Schiller, chair of Fit Europe and uh, Wanda Brunello, vice chair, I will be hosting this webinar. I'm a conference interpreter, member of uh, Asso Interpreti and uh, VKD in BDU, which are respectively the Italian and German conference interpreters associations. And uh, it is uh, for me and for us such a pleasure to see so many professionals interested in the topic uh, of uh, sound, sound quality and RSI. And first of all, uh, some housekeeping. All your microphones should be muted upon entry, but if not, please mute yourself. All videos uh, should also be switched off upon entry to save on bandwidth as uh, we are really a lot. Uh, we had uh, 500 registrations. We hope that someone else will join us. Um, and uh, by saving on bandwidth, uh, we should uh, provide uh, uh, for a better quality of uh, uh, presentation. There will be a Q&A session after the speakers have uh, finished uh, their presentation. And if you have uh, a question, one or more questions, uh, please use uh, the chat function or uh, raise your hand uh, uh, function. And we will endeavor to address all your questions. The webinar is being recorded so that uh, it can be made available for those who cannot be here today. And by continuing to participate in the webinar, you are consenting to this recording. Um, besides uh, the two speakers who will be introduced uh, soon by Wanda, I uh, would uh, first of all hand the mic over to Annette Schiller chair of Fit Europe. You have the mic, Annette. Thank you, Gabriela. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, as Gabriela said, good evening, good afternoon, or even good morning, depending on which part of the world you are in. We're delighted to welcome so many participants, literally from all around the globe. Apart from Europe, we welcome many colleagues from Central and South America, from the US and Canada, and even from New Zealand and Australia. As most of you probably already know, FIT Europe is one of the three regional centers of FIT, the International Federation of Translators. We represent uh, about 60 professional associations of translators, interpreters, and terminologists, which is about 40,000 individual members or professionals. Our work, of course, is normally within the European context. Uh, this webinar is a slight departure from that. So um, the purpose of FIT Europe uh, at European level is to improve the status of language professionals, to increase visibility of our work and the awareness outside of the language industry of how crucial our work is for society as a whole. Uh, and we also aim to improve dialogue and collaboration with other stakeholders in the industry. And to do this, our work takes on various forms, projects. We have at the moment a GDPR project. Um, running in collaboration with EUATC, which is the European Union of Translator Company Associations. We have a project on CPD Europe-wide, and we've just started up a new e-translation project, um, which is in relation to the EU machine translation system. We're involved in a round table with other European stakeholders that is facilitated by the Director General for Translation in Europe. Uh, we run events such as this webinar. In the, in the olden days, we ran conferences, physical conferences. We will hope to go back to that next year or the year after. And we also run surveys. For example, during the first few months of COVID-19, we ran regular surveys to gather information on how the professionals were doing in each of the European countries. Uh, 
to see what uh, economically and professionally how their work was going. And of course, we were also active on the various social media channels. So against all this or with all this, we still need to be masters or as they say, mistresses of our own destiny, not just accepting without question everything the industry sends our way. Um, Freelancers are, after all, the, the little people in the whole business, but that doesn't mean we don't have strength in numbers. And while we're used to evolving and adapting, it is always important to question innovations, new products, new proposals, to make sure that they really will help us to do our job even better, while allowing us to have a good work-life balance. So, as we all know, of course, the world as we knew it at the start of the year no longer exists. Our, our professions have been impacted by COVID-19 to a greater or lesser extent. And while we can safely say at this stage, thank goodness for technology, because without the online music, films, box sets, meetings, webinars, and social get-togethers, I believe we would be in a far worse place today. On the other hand, in relation to our interpreters in Europe, we have a situation where things have moved extremely quickly since last February to remote simultaneous interpreting. Being in lockdown for many months, however, has also given our experts in the field, which are the interpreters themselves, the opportunity to test and analyze various systems. So today, Christian and Andrea will present some very interesting findings from their research relating to the impact of sound on health and well-being. And if there is one thing we have learned over this past year, it is that our health is our wealth. So we hope you enjoy the webinar and that you will find plenty of food for thought. Thank you. So now I will introduce, I will... Uh, no, sorry, can I interrupt okay. you, Wanda? Yes, because I, I can. have to do a short introduction. Sure. Yes. And, um, well, um, as uh, Annette said, conference interpreters have been severely impacted by the pandemic. And uh, before the crisis, the market was uh, still dominated by traditional on-site conferences. With the crisis, traditional conference interpreting was uh, sort of obliterated and there was a massive shift uh, to RSI. And even international institutions had uh, to drastically reduce their interpretation services and shift to remote interpretation due to lockdown and social distancing measures. Now, since the beginning of uh, the COVID pandemic, almost all national and international associations of conference interpreters have drawn up guidelines, recommendations or position papers. And um, let's say August and September showed the first signs uh, of a recovery also in our profession of a return to a new normal here in Europe, but uh, also the first signs of uh, a second wave. Uh, this meaning that the old normal will not return for several years or will probably never return at all. Um, I can tell you that I, as an environmental and climate activist, uh, firmly believe that we cannot go back to the old normal, meaning that we will have to resort to remote interpretation to a larger extent than we probably would like to. And since the very beginning of the pandemic, there has been a boom in RSI uh, webinars, sorry, um, teaching interpreters how uh, IDP platforms work, what equipment to use, what the settings should be, etc. But very little has been said about acoustics and health issues for conference interpreters. And this is why we as Fit Europe decided to organize this somehow different webinar to unveil these aspects as well. And I had bumped into Andrea and Christian's first articles on LinkedIn in May this year and attended a couple of webinars on the topic, uh, uh, one of which uh, organized also by ASSO Interpreti, the Italian associa association. So now I guess it's really your turn, Wanda, to okay. introduce our two <laughs> colleagues and the speakers. Uh, Wanda, okay. the mic is yours. Thank you, Gabriela. So I'm very proud to introduce you Andrea Cagnato, who is a conference interpreter. He's uh, also European Union accredited and a musician and voice coach. He has worked extensively on the neurophysiology of the voice, the auditory system, 
and physics, including open nonlinear complex systems physics. He's graduated in saxophone, lecturer in public speaking and voice, and holds an annual seminar at the Interpreter School of Trieste. He has also um, written some articles that are very interesting um, for our seminar today, the proposed pathodynamics of the junk sound syndrome, why RSI sound is bad for the interpreter's ears, headsets won't work miracles. Here is how digital sound gets degraded in the 21st century. Acoustic shocks are red herring, a different not so silent threat is slowly poisoning in the interpreter's ears. You can find them in LinkedIn. And there's also one in Italian, but I will spare my Italian pronunciation, so I will mention this one. Sorry, Andrea. And now I would like to introduce you Christian Giuducci. He's a conference interpreter. He's a European Union accredited and expert in telecommunications and electronics. Christian is able to configure and manage company network and to build microphones and the like. He's a trendsetter on headphones and the like in Brussels. So he's very well known for that. And he has an article who's very interesting, why interpreter hops can fix toxic sound. And I will give the floor to our two speakers now. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thank you very much for your kind introduction. Um, there's one thing I would like to say uh, straight away. One of the articles I was credited with was actually written by Christian Guiducci, the one on headsets. That was, uh, I published it on my okay. LinkedIn page, but it was written by, by yeah, Christian. I Apologies, because uh, Wanda told me, oh, I, I found only one article by, by Christian, and I said, My, I remember he wrote two. <laughs> so, okay. okay. He's the tech guy. Okay. <laughs> thank you. No problem. You. No problem. Well, uh, thank you very much for having us here. Um, and, well, uh, first and foremost, I hope you can hear me decently. Because I will be doing some tests tonight, uh, including, I mean, I will be using this webinar also to conduct a few tests with my, um, with my viewership, with our viewership, um, tests of different microphone setups and of a new, a new audio configuration that is made available by, by um, Zoom, which is the hi-fi mode. Uh, what you're hearing now probably uh, reminds you of the type of uh, sound feed you get in the booth in real conferences. Um, I would love uh, to have feedback on this, um, even from participants. You can you can uh, interact, of course, using the chat, and uh, it should be more or less more or less what you get, what you, you what you get in the booth. I will later um, explain what I'm using, and. Uh, okay, okay, I'm getting positive feedback on, on the sound that I'm making right now. So, uh, this particular sound is made possible by the new configuration you have, you have on Zoom, which is called Zoom Hi-Fi, which is uh, possibly the first good news I've had since February. Uh, because, uh, well, this is not what RSI normally sounds like. What you're hearing now is not what RSI sound normally sounds like. And you will notice that I'm not using a headset. And I will tell you more about the type of microphone I'm using now. Um, I've prepared um, a presentation and, uh, and I have followed the unwritten guidelines for all international speakers, which means I've, I have actually concluded working on my presentations 14, 45 minutes ago. <laughs> So I apologize in advance uh, if, if, I mean, should there be any spelling mistakes or weird stuff in there? Uh, well, I just kept writing and writing because I thought this webinar would begin at 6 p.m. So, all right. <laughs> all right. Um, I have prepared a presentation. I will start uh, sharing it uh, before I'm, maybe, maybe a couple of words of introduction uh, 
by by my uh, good friend uh, Christian Guiducci. Would you like to come in, Christian, and say hello? Um, yes, I can say hello. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, what should I say? I think Andrea said everything. Um, I was already stolen an article, so it's a good start. Um, no, I'm kidding, of course. Um, nothing else to say, but uh, just uh, I will maybe intervene later and um, enjoy Andrea's presentation and nothing else for the moment to say. Or maybe yes, I uh, didn't hear in my presentation just as an information, I'm blind, so um, if you write some questions, maybe someone will read them out to me, or maybe you can intervene directly with audio in Zoom. Okay, I think I said everything for the moment, and then talk to you soon. Okay, right now my presentation is is frozen for some reason and I will try to... Oh, there it goes now. Okay, uh, let me launch it and share my screen. Hmm. Yeah, but before that I need to share my screen. <clears throat> There we are, there we are, and, okay, slideshow, there we go. Poor sound in the virtual booth, performance and health implications. Now, why, why am I writing virtual booth? Uh, first, first and foremost, because um, you can get poor sound in the, re in the real conference setting as well. Uh, RSI is not the only type of uh, situation where you can get sound that is not good enough for conference interpreting and that is doing harm to your ears. Uh, in my experience talking about sound to uh, the interpreting community, I have realized that um, the notion of what sound is is not that widespread. So uh, bear with me, please, if you already know about this stuff, but I will so still um, try to exp explain the basics, basics of sound, because what I normally hear when, when sound is being discussed in, uh, in the interpreting industry is decibels and loudness, as if sound was just how loud. Sound, I mean, there are different parameters you can use to, to um, understand sound, but I will focus on two, on two which are loudness express, expressed in decibels, which is how loud, how intense the signal is, and pitch. Pitch is, uh, I mean, what you will have on a musical instrument, uh, a lower note, uh, uh, when you play a lower uh, note on the piano and, and then you go up and play higher notes, pitch goes up and down. Uh, and pitch is expressed in Hertz. You will hear me a lot uh, tonight talking about Hertz. Hertz um, is, a, is, is a measure of um, frequency uh, and uh, basically um, a sound wave um, uh, has a specific freq frequency. It oscillates in time and, and the number of oscillations per time unit are measured in Hertz. Now what you see on screen right now here is one sound wave is what we normally would call a sine wave because of its shape but what we need to understand about sound is that sound does not appear in nature as individual sound, sound waves the only way to generate uh, a single sound wave is use a synthesizer a sine wave generator what sound normally looks like is a stockpile of individual um, sound waves that create um, patterns. You, this is a spectrogram. You will see a lot of spectrograms in my presentation tonight because they're useful to understand what sound is all about. Um, each of these um, zigzagging 
patterns here is a sound wave and this is just part of the human spectrum. This is a spectrogram of my voice reading out a text for about five min uh, four minutes. Now, um, as you can see here, um, the human voice produces uh, frequency information that, go that begins at zero, more or less, hertz, and goes all the way up to at least 20,000 kilohertz, to, to, sorry, to 20,000 hertz. Um, this is the sort of uh, frequency range that you, the human ear can hear. Uh, please notice, um, you will find spectral energy uh, concentrated in areas. Uh, I mean, the green stuff is where the energy is, um, is there, is intensive. The blue stuff is almost no energy there. The black stuff is digital silence. So uh, I will use these spectrograms to show you um, what a normal voice is and what, you know, what we typically receive when we are performing uh, simultaneous interpreting over a uh, remote simultaneous interpreting platform. Now, this is my voice, but you might say you are a voice coach and your voice might look different from, from the voices of other people. This is a female voice, 40 years old, untrained. Okay? Please note the amount of green stuff on this spectrum and uh, you will see that it reaches up to 18,000, 20,000, oh, not everywhere and of course most of it concentrates between the, the 0 and 4,000 and more or less 6 and 12, 13,000 hertz frequency bands but it doesn't mean there is no information up here and that, inf that information you can, that can be found up here is not useful but I'll, I'll get to that later on. So you could compare um, the human voice, the sound of human voice to a huge club sandwich with a lot of stuff in it and your ears are supposed uh, to pick out on that stuff. I mean they, they want to have it all because, because they like it. Now let's start and, and see what happens when you are working in uh, the uh, in uh, over a, an RSI platform. Now this slide shows a comparison between the same person. Uh, this is probably one prime minister, maybe the no Norwegian prime minister. I can't remember. It was published in my first article anyway. Um, now. To the left here, you can see um, the speaker addressing a web conference you, uh, from a hub, from a hub, using an ISO compliant headset, a microphone. Okay, as you can, and this is, oh no, this is a WHO. Okay, this is the, uh, okay, this is the um, Secretary General of the WHO, and here is the same speaker on video, not over the platform. You will see the frequency spectrum is not complete, which is, which is typical. I mean, I downloaded the speech from YouTube, and and they do some uh, they um, they cut off the upper part of the spectrum for for frequency band. I mean, to 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 to, to save on, on on bandwidth. But have a look at the differences. You will see that uh, strange phenomena appear here. Uh, and you, you do not see um, frequency information concentrate and create patterns where it would normally create patterns. You can see holes here, you can see straight lines. I mean, when I, when I see these straight lines, and, I, 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 and please, um, please notice those straight lines, uh, to me they remember the, um, the borders uh, between African states that was drawn um, on a map uh, by uh, by um, by European superpowers back then, and we all know how they affected the following history of the African continent. Uh, moving on, more examples. This is the no Norwegian Prime Minister. To the left, the Norwegian Prime Minister is, is addressing the UN General Assembly, conference setting. Uh, the signal goes up to 12,000 hertz, which is typical of many conference settings. 
but have a look at the same voice broadcasted um, over uh, over a uh, well-known RSI platform uh, at a uh, very high-profile web conference. Again, uh, the Prime Minister was talking from a hub using a compliant microphone, ISO compliant microphone. But have a look at what happens to her voice. There's much less information in this voice. Much less information in this voice. And a lot of digital silence here. You can see it here and what happens between 6,000 and 10, 12,000 completely disappears. Now, uh, this is what um, this is what a very high-profile meeting, hybrid meeting, looked like in June 2020 while uh, a uh, high-profile conference room was being configured to host to host platforms. Uh, I spoke to the sound engineers who were doing this and they said they were playing a lot with compressors and limiters because the idea of using compressors and limiters when performing RSI was becoming fashionable. Now even the even the um, the room signal. I mean, what you see here is some some speeches are coming in coming in from the platform. The one that are poorer here, for instance, they they are platform speeches. But you also have signal from the room, and it has been highly impoverished. You can see that the average useful signal here does not does not reach beyond five thousand hertz. Would you like to have a look? Let me show you again what it should look like. Okay, because, and that's what it looks like. The red bar here is where uh, ISO uh, requirements would uh, would demand um, that uh, frequency um, that frequency range uh, gets to. Okay, so this is the ISO requirement, which is obviously not being complied with here. Now, uh, this is a this is the president of the European Cent C Central Bank, which I had, um, whom I had to interpret earlier this week. Um, she was addressing a very high-level conference uh, using a pretty well-known uh, RSI platform, and as you can see here, the platform is probably striving to improve its frequency response. Of course, Mrs. Lagarde was using a professional setup. She had a conference microphone. And have a look at the platform here. No, sorry, at the spectrogram here. You can still see a straight line cutting off at 8,000 hertz. 8,000 hertz is a typical... Um, uh, it, it is a typical area of the spectrum where, where stuff begins to happen when, uh, when you're in RSI mode. But you can see there is, there is some uh, frequency information going beyond uh, that line, which is um, fine, but still, um, it, but still just, just, you know, to help you remember, sorry, um, to help you remember, this is what it should look like, more or less. And this is what it sounded like. Okay, you can see at the bottom here, frequency information is basically concentrating in the area where the basic information regarding pitch and vowels is is contained. But these areas, sorry, these areas of the spectrum here, they contain a lot of information about um, harmonics. Um, harmonics of vowels, harmonics of uh, pitch, consonants, a lot of information about consonants here. This is basically noise, but we make an, a lot of noise when we speak, and not having that type of frequency information when you are interpreting makes your, where, makes your already difficult listening task particularly daunting. Now, this is what um, Mrs. Lagarde sounded like, I think it was uh, sorry, Tuesday this week, 
can't remember. Um, some of you might begin to think, okay, um, you are using a particular instrument uh, and, and, and software, uh, a piece of software to, 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 to conduct your measurements, but is it the software? Maybe using a different software would, would give us a different picture. Here it is. This is called Voce Vista. I'm using a trial version right now, but I'll soon have to buy a license. And this is Mrs. Lagarde. And this is what I look like on Voce Vista. Of course, um, when, I, when I show you these spectrograms, these were acquired using a professional studio microphone. But the professional studio microphone does not make your voice richer. It just provides a, a more faithful reproduction of what it hears. Okay, so a microphone does not improve sound. It, it is just it just provides a more faithful reproduction of what it hears. And and although um, Mrs. Lagarde was not using a studio grade microphone, um, this is not sufficient and this is not acceptable for 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 a, a sound feed. I, could, I can already tell you it sounded very artificial, very metallic, a lot of frequency information missing and I will uh, tell you more about that and especially the reasons why this is a problem, both in terms of the interpreter's performance and, but, and in terms of what it does to your ears. Now, uh, Canadian interpreters have become uh, known worldwide in the interpreting community because of the problems they have been having uh, since February March this year they were the first to report uh, a huge incidence of um, hearing issues uh, a few weeks into virtual Parliament I took the liberty of measuring uh, a few of their uh, committees um, which can be downloaded uh, over the internet and this is what it looked like in May this year. And please bear in mind that all speakers were, were, were using recommended headsets. Okay? So the headset... So let me ask you, is the headset a solution here? But uh, we will try to answer that question later on. And the good news. The good news is um, the new release, uh, Zoom's new release published uh, at the beginning of this month contains a hi-fi uh, function. They call it music friendly because, because uh, one of the myths uh, we will try to debunk tonight here is that you only need decent sound if you're broadcasting music because you don't need that to understand speech. Uh, Christian will tell you much more about this later on and I will provide them food for thought, uh, food for thought as well. This is what Zoom Hi-Fi looks like when using a professional microphone on Zoom. Let me now, um, let me now um, tell you what sort of microphone I'm using right now. I'm using the inbuilt microphone of my, um, of my USB webcam. And only that sounds as good as conference sound if the platform allows hi-fi sound. And now Zoom allows hi-fi sound. It, my, my Zoom account is set for hi-fi. And even a, even a uh, Logitech, we, I'm sorry, I, should be mention, I shouldn't be mentioning names. Uh, by the way, I have no conflicts of interest. I do not work for, for Zoom. I do not receive any money from either Zoom or any of the manufacturers of the equipment I'm using. And I will try not to mention the names. I, saw, I already mentioned one, but I shouldn't be. So I'm using uh, an uh, inbuilt microphone that came with uh, the uh, USB camera. But I'm now going to let you hear what a different setup sounds like. Bear with me for a second, please. I will have to stop sharing, but I will soon revert to my presentation. Okay.
Now, could you please confirm that this is different? Does it make a difference now? Can you hear me better? Sorry, I'm not reading the chat. Let's have a look at the chat. A lot different, not better, worse to me. Yes, Andrea, oh. you s probably switched to the lavalier mic. Yeah, I but did. You have a slightly lower volume, but this is a problem of configuration. Oh, I see. Okay, let me. Um, okay, let me keep it this way. Okay, maybe if you can slightly adjust the gain or the adjust volume. Adjust the gain. Okay, I will. I will. But but or actually, otherwise leave clear. it like this. It's it's certainly clearer than before. You have no I mean but no I'll, reverberation. I will still adjust it's definitely game. clearer. I will still adjust the game. Just give me a sec. I want this to work. Is this any louder now? No, it's not louder. Is it any louder slightly, now? Slightly louder. Slightly but it's louder. very clear. It's very clear. Let me, let me put it here then. Yes, definitely. Okay, closer now. Yes. Okay, so this is what a... Um, so not particularly better because it was already decent earlier on. That's the problem. Um, let me go back to the chat. I'm still sharing my present. Oh gosh, what's happening now? Okay, nope. Sorry, bear with me for a sec. This is the sort of stuff that normally happens when you're live. Okay, here. Uh huh. The chat. I, I would like to read a few reactions. Uh, chat. There you go. Not much better. Love your bouncy chair, though. Of course, you can hear my bouncy chair now, because noise suppression, background noise suppression, has been uh, has been deactivated. There is no way of getting hi-fi sound if you are uh, cancelling background noise. The two do not um, do not uh, the, 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 uh, there's a conflict between the two i mean there's no way you can have both so you will hear my my chair right now no you can't hear you can no, you can't we hear see my you bouncing oh you see me <laughs> bouncing okay vediamo la sedia okay okay all right all right someone can hear it Oh yes, the webcam. Yes, sorry. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> if I if I if I if I get even closer now, you will probably hear the type of sound you normally hear on television. Okay, how many interpreters uh, uh, attending tonight would rather work with this type of sound feed than with the typical um, sound feed you get over R R RSI? You. Jan Christoph, you would. Not for sure. Okay, cleaner sound. Cleaner sound. Too muffled. Orietta Olivetti, too muffled. Well, I, I would like to discuss that. You would. Cleaner sound. I can... Too muffled. Okay, okay. Um, what about we move to a different microphone? How does this sound? Yeah. Can you hear the difference? Much lower. Wow, again. How does this sound? Muffled. <laughs> oh, awkward background noise. Richard, better. Okay. 
Okay, of course I I have to 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 to, to talk into the microphone now. Background yes. sound. What sort of background sound? Like on the radio, exactly. Like a fan is on. Background No, but it's not my background noise. Uh, it was somebody else's. It's been deactivated now. You can hear the depth now. Yes. Like on the radio. All right. Now, this is what this is what can be done what can be done uh, remotely if the platform is a, if the platform allows it but I can but but I can ensure you that if I use the same microphone and setup and uh, and sound card and so on uh, you wouldn't want to interpret this sound why you wouldn't want to interpret this not clear listening in most three news. Well, uh, we will. Uh, uh, there will be a debate about uh, at the end of this presentation. So I will. I will uh, not distinctive enough. Well, um, I would love to have your feedback, even, and you will be allowed to 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 take the floor, to take the floor uh, later on. So uh, this is one of the points I would like. I would like to discuss. Um, going back to my presentation. Um, there you go. Share screen. And launch the presentation. There we are. Let me now remove this. How do I remove this? Okay. Now, um, the type of uh, sound you hear now is what you get on the radio and is what you get on audiovisual audiovisual products, um, um, e-books, for instance. Uh, this is studio sound, and it, it corresponds to the huge club sandwich you have on the slide. What normally happens uh, when you are interpreting remotely is that uh, the platform um, manipulates that uh, signal and it uh, compresses it in order to ship it. To, to broadcast it and to save on bandwidth costs and to uh, uh, speech optimize it. Speech optimize it, remove background noise, remove whatever whatever they think it should be removed. It gets into, it is, it is reduced, it is packaged and it is broadcast. When it is opened, uh, when the package is opened on the other end, there are, there, there's a lot of stuff missing. So the, so the, um, the product is reconditioned and filler material is 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 added and it basically sounds plastic and it tastes plastic this is one of the reason the reasons why it sounds weird and i will explain to you why um it it's it actually is uh unhealthy um I've been having lots of conversations with my good friend Christian Guiducci over the last few months, and one of the th one of the things we were talking about is the the notion of redundancy. I've used the definition that I've found on uh, Wikipedia here to to explain to you what redund that redundancy is. The human voice, uh, like many uh, biological systems and like well designed engineering systems, is a redundant system. It means it it it's got more information. Then you actually need to process it. Why does it have more information than actually needed? Because redundancy is the provision of functional capabilities that would be unnecessary in a fault-free environment. This can consist of a backup of backup components that automatically kick in if one component fails. For instance, and this is why I like this definition, large cargo trucks can lose a tire without any major consequences because they have many tires it all it, it, it dawned on me and it's the reason the reason why trucks have so many tires i had never realized and uh, so going back to our spectrogram here uh, a lot of the information you find in a voice is um, a duplicate of information you will find that I mean in this area of the spectrum you will find duplicate information that uh, duplicates uh, uh, of the information you can find in this area of the spectrum where the main pitch and vowel information is but 
the moment uh, your, diff your, your listening task becomes difficult, your ear relies on redundancy. So redundancy is uh, a typical feature of the human voice and of all biological um, um, systems and of well-designed engineering systems. The reason why you can you can uh, web stream, uh, I mean, if you if you have Netflix, Netflix is a redundant system. Uh, you will normally have typically have very few interruptions, and they do that because they um, they have a redundant broadcasting system, even if you're using Wi-Fi. Now, um, to me, uh, RSI sound is muffled and artificial. If it were text, we have many translators here listening. If you were to translate uh, a text that reads, you know, like here or here, I know translation work is normally, uh, I mean, translators are normally required to have a pretty, import, a pretty huge output. Uh, and and translate lots of words every day so you have to be pretty quick and can you translate quick if what you are reading is this quality here for instance I don't think you can I mean and, and it will wear uh, the wear and tear for your eyes at the end of the week will be huge the same happens to your ears why is uh, uh, artificial RSI uh, post-processed sound bad, especially in the booth. Because we depend on high and extremely high frequencies, and by high frequencies I will mean frequencies above the 7, 8,000 8, 8, hertz um, um, band. We depend on high and extremely high frequencies to help us perform difficult listening tasks. This is not because I say so. There are 70 years of scientific research and tons of literature that confirm this theory. It is called the cocktail party problem. It was first studied by uh, a scholar um, called Cherry in 1953. And it has been studied, been studied extensively ever since. Um, poor, um, uh, an incomplete and highly manipulated frequency range is also uh, is also bad ergonomics. If you're, let, let me go back to let me go back to one of these. Okay. If your uh, useful information um, is concentrated in the one to four five kilohertz range, uh, you have you you will have to turn up your volume knob, and to have provided you have two signals, one is full spectrum and one is um, limited, like this one. The same amount of that you, you, you and, and, and let's say uh, the two signals have the same uh, decibel level, so the same loudness. Okay, they're exactly uh, the same loudness, and but loudness here is concentrated in a tiny bit of the spectrum. Now, physics tell us that mechanical pressure varies depending on the area it concentrates on. We can all do a, a nice little experiment here. If I, if I take my hand and press my other hand against it as hard as I can, or at least at sufficiently hard, and I keep it this way, say, one minute, two minutes, three minutes, this hand will not suffer. I mean, it will be tiresome for my shoulders, but I mean, the, the pressure I'm exerting here, let's say I'm exerting one kilogram of pressure over this, er this area, over this area. Okay, right. But what would happen if I were to exert one kilogram, same, same amount of pressure, but concentrate it here, three fingers, same amount of pressure. Could you imagine what would happen in three, four or five minutes? Okay, this is an interesting model to understand how 
poor sound with an impoverished um, frequency range impacts on our cochlea. Um, the minute the sound, the moment the sound gets uh, to your cochlea, it 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 uh, it causes a mechanical stimulation of the of the um, basal membrane, which is where the mechanical impulse is um, is turned into an electrical impulse. Uh, the cochlea is our body's frequency analyzer, and depending on the area where the peak of stimulation is. Uh, the body will, um, uh, our brain will determine what frequency it was. Okay? Now, uh, imagine what happens when the peaks always tend to concentrate in the same area. You don't, you no longer have a widespread stimulation, you have peaks concentrating always in the same area. If I have 70 dB of pressure over a wider area or 70 dB of pressure over a smaller area, the mechanical stimulation will be much more intensive. Then again, frequency deprivation. Um, you have seen it here. The frequency range here is much poorer than here. This is deprived of, of a lot of frequencies. This is deprived of a, of a lot of frequencies. This again is deprived of a lot of frequencies. It means your ear receives a signal that is frequency deprived. Okay. Here we have a uh, we have the use it or lose it uh, principle. Uh, you can find this in the medical literature. I'm not making up this stuff. This is pretty important. Uh, I will show you later on a list of the uh, of the papers I've gone through and where I've actually found this information. It's it's out there. It's in the medical literature. And, and again, frequency deprivation um, s appears or would appear to have impacts on your dopamine levels. Now, dopamine uh, is a neurotransmitter. Uh, it, uh, it has many functions. Um, one of these functions is one of one of these functions is um, protecting your hair cells against deterioration and and loud noise. So less dopamine less protection for your hair cells your hair hair cells are uh, what are what makes up the uh, sensory tissue inside your cochlea now um, i told you one of the first problem with 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 this type of signal is the cocktail party problem uh, the scores of uh, medical papers you can find on the internet uh, that that delve into the cocktail party problem uh, all agree on the fact that in order to follow and retain information from multiple conversation streams the same thing you will do at a cocktail party you can you can listen to a conversation you're, you're taking part in but right at your back someone is starting to say that they have them have invested their money in a particular financial product and that they have doubled their revenue in two weeks and they have I mean they have become rich now instantly you want to listen to that conversation and we are perfectly capable of doing so how do we do this we our brain in order to do so relies on sound localization in order to separate one feed from another now sound sound localization occurs both both on the horizontal plane and on the vertical plane on the vertical plane um, sound localization cues are provided by high and very high frequencies above seven and eight thousand Hertz again this is medical literature uh, the, um, these th this part of the frequency range also provide provides some information on um, on lo sound lo source localization on the horizontal plane most information concerning sound localization on the horizontal plane comes from lower frequencies and binaural phase difference which means the difference uh, t uh, the so the, we have two ears uh, so sound waves will impact on this ear first and on this ear a few milliseconds later our brain can can calculate the difference and tell us that the source is on this side because there is a slight offset 
in the time uh, sound takes to get to both ears. But uh, in the booth you have one problem. Even if you cover both ears when you're interpreting, you will not be able to, to uh, perform um, horizontal source localization because that would require a stereo signal. So that would require two different uh, pieces of information in two years. And what you get in conferences is double mono because you have mono microphones. So you get two mono feeds in two years and there is no phase difference between, between one year, sorry, one ear and, and the other one. So no sound localize, localization possible if you use both ear. The only sound localization cues you, you can rely on during simultaneous interpreting come from high and very high frequencies. Again, tons of literature have been, uh, have been produced on this particular subject over the last 70 years. And um, the cocktail party problem uh, is, a, uh, is defined uh, as a, uh, is a metaphor of a listening, uh, sorry, uh, of a difficult listening task. Uh, Cherry called that a dichotic listening task, i.e. a listening task where the listener has to manage two different feeds at the same time, or two or more, but um, in the booth you have to manage two. You have to manage your source and your output. This is one of the reasons why many interpreters uh, keep only one ear covered and listen to their source using only one ear, which is normally the left ear because it's, it is considered to be the best ear. There is literature on that as well. Now, um, this is a very, a very important thing to take into account because what, I, what I've heard over the last few months when people, even including doctors, when people talk about um, the, the problems of simultaneous interpreters, they all seem to assume that we are not talking and listening at the same time. I've even heard people say, if you listen to with one ear only, you are basically functioning like a, uh, um, like a uh, mono-orally deaf person, which means a person who is deaf in one year. And I was, I mean, I, I was a little bit puzzled because I know that when I'm performing simultaneous interpreting, both, my, both ears are working. This ear is listening to what I, well, it's, I mean, let's, I'm simplifying it, but this ear is listening to what I'm producing and this ear is listening to the source. So, I mean, you're, you're always using both ears. You're only separating the two sources, both um, using, um, using spectral cues, so high frequencies, and mechanically by physically separating one source and feed it, feeding it into only one ear. Now, um, I, already, I already asked you, I asked you to perform the pressure experiment this one. Uh, you can see here this is a basal membrane, uh, an, uncoil, an uncoiled cochlea. This, is normally, uh, this normally has a spiral structure, but if you uncoil, uncoil the spiral, this is what it looks like. And you can see the peaks. Remember, if you concentrate your peaks always in the same area, you might end up overusing that area and maybe causing damage. What do you think? Now, the use it or lose it principle. Um, here's a non-exhaustive list of studies, scientific papers, published stuff. Uh, it took me about five minutes to complete this research, so I assume there is at least 20 more out there, which I'm not familiar with, which I haven't gone through. And this is what Med Savvy Folks, with an opinion on, on audiology, think about the use it or lose it principle. We, it means if you do not use part of your cochlea because it, no, it is not stimulated, because it, you are frequency deprived, you will probably end up losing those uh, frequency bands. And this has been shown both in, in um, animal and in human experiments. The evidence is out there. It has been published. So uh, you actually, I mean, just have a look at the titles. Like experiments on obstructive hearing loss show that sensory deprivation leads to permanent hearing loss. 
permanent hearing loss. Okay. Now, um, high frequencies are sexy. Um, the presence of high and very high frequencies, again above seven, eight thousand hertz, elicits a um, ref a reflex in one of our um, pinna muscles. The pinna is uh, the out the outer ear. It's got tiny little muscles that no longer that are no longer able to move your ear, but they still have retained a a, a function. And uh, one of those muscles, the post-auricular muscle, has a reflex that activates when you see pictures of good food, erotica, when you listen to pleasant sounds, and in a number of other pleasant situations associated to, with pleasure. Now, um, the post-auricular muscle reflex also activates when, I mean, it deactivates when you deprive sound of exactly those those um, frequencies, and it is back on when you when you expose um, experimental subjects to those frequencies, so uh, I haven't found any smoking gun in the literature here. I have to come clean. It's a hypothesis, but it is a, it it reacts uh, in the same situations where dopamine is produced. Sorry, is produced. Uh, and dopamine, one of the centers producing dopamine is the brainstem exactly where uh, sound localization and high frequency processing occur. All right, it, it's, it's right there. Same place, same, same area in the brainstem. Interesting coincidence. Now, uh, this is a type of symptoms uh, uh, simultaneous interpreter, interpreters are beginning to experience more than they usually do, uh, especially when they're working uh, remotely. Tinnitus, which means a ringing in your ear, a noise, a high frequency noise in your ear, fullness of the ear, sensory neural hearing loss, which means your hair cells are dead and, you, and your hear, ability to hear uh, specific areas of, of the frequency range is lost and it is believed to be permanent. Fatigue, nausea and headache. Now headache is actually very interesting because um, uh, headache is, can, is often associated with pressure levels, um, cerebr cerebral spinal fluid pressure levels and cerebral spinal fluid is produced exactly in the same area of the brainstem where all the rest of the phenomena I've been discussing so far are located. Uh huh. Moving on. Now, the mainstream theory behind these symptoms is called the acoustic shocks disorder. What, the main reason why um, acoustic shocks uh, are believed to be the uh, cause, the cause, the root of these symptoms, is that the same symptoms appear in people who have been exposed to very loud, to, to sudden, very loud noises. Um, so there's this assumption which is actually very controversial in the literature because audiologists do not agree on acoustic shocks even existing for a number of reasons which um, I might be touching upon later on. The assumption, the controversial, assum controversial assumption here is that if you have these symptoms you must have been exposed to loud noise. Uh, the mother of acoustic uh, of the acoustic shock theory is a is a scholar, uh, an Australian scholar, uh, Dr. Westcott. Westcott, I, I, if I'm pronouncing her her surname right, her, who conducted um, who conducted acoustic shock disorder studies on call center populations. The assumption being. Uh, the reason why these populations have uh, such a high incidence of these symptoms is that they are exposed to some loud noises uh, being broadcast down the telephone line. These loud noises increase fax sounds. And, well, I've listened to fax sounds and I didn't find them particularly loud. And I've, Well, I'm, I'm 42 years old. Uh, I have never heard anything particularly loud over the phone, but still, one of the very interesting um, aspects of the studies conducted by uh, by Dr. Westcott is that 
um, a number of uh, measures were taken in call centers to prevent uh, to prevent acoustic shocks, to to limit uh, the loudness uh, and to limit any sudden spikes in order to to be sure that no uh, that, that the decibel level will never get high enough to cause an acoustic shock. So limiters have been used in call centers and Dr. Westcott herself in one of her studies, I think it was, uh, it's in her study, the one that was published in 2008. I mean, uh, there are two, you've got them on my slide here. You will find it in a study. She admits that even if limiters were implemented in call centers, that did not solve the problem. The symptoms continued. More and more people uh, developed these symptoms. So these symptoms do not seem to be related to sudden um, sudden sudden noise incidents incidents at least not in call centers i mean of course uh, of course you, if you are exposed to a sudden noise incident these symptoms may appear but apparently not in call centers because limiters were in place and symptoms kept appearing now one other aspect that i find uh, puzzling in the mainstream theory the one on uh, acoustic shocks is that uh, researchers assume that if you have those symptoms you must have heard a very loud sound but how loud is loud are there any measurements have any of these uh, sudden spikes in decibel sound pressure have any of these spikes been measured are there any measures any objective measures the answer is no the answer is no at least not any that I have found or not any that I have seen presented or published in the literature and it wouldn't be difficult to measure it I mean at least in the interpreting in the interpreting industry I mean, all you have to do is is uh, is um, use measurement I mean use decibel measure measuring equipment um, plug it in plug it into a an interpreting console in a place where I mean at, at any international organization that uses interpreters day in day out you keep it there three months and you have lots of data on any spikes sudden spikes of sound pressure but t this is this, this has never been done and it is assumed that interpreters also hear sudden spikes of um, of of um, of noise which could be caused by microphones falling on the floor. I don't know. I don't know about you, but that that didn't happen to me a lot. Or people tapping on their microphone to make sure it's on. I will do it right now. Okay. This is an acoustic shock. Uh, I've even heard people say, "I mean, um, you don't realize you hear those." Um, sudden noises but you do but you do hear them but can similar incidents go unnoticed what i have here is is what uh i mean the sound the, the acoustic shock shock threshold should begin an, uh, around 90 decibel according to the literature now 90 decibel is more or less well, well 80 decibels is a vacuum cleaner 90 decibels is a shouted conversation. Um, a passing motorcycle two meters away is 100 decibels. An ambulance, a passing ambulance is 120 decibels. I mean, how many times have you had a, a motorcycle or an ambulance passing you by two meters away, 10 meters away? Did that cause you those symptoms? And did you ever hear something that loud while interpreting. I'm not saying annoying. I've heard annoying sounds, but annoying doesn't mean particularly loud. That it doesn't mean that it's 100 decibel. Feedback noise can be very annoying and it can be bad for you. I mean, every time I hear feedback noise, I remove my headphones immediately. And I've seen people keep them on, but is there any evidence that that is 100 decibels? No, there is not. Apparently, no one has bothered to measure it, but they still assume it's loud incidents. Well, based on what I've seen so far, I mean, based on the measurements that I've shown you so far, and, and on the content, contents of medical literature, I've been 
um, mentioning in my presentation, I tend to believe that poor quality sound where the frequency range is impoverished and highly manipulated by algorithms that are used to remove background noise and Christian will tell you more about that in a minute I think that type of sound feed is bad for you because it makes the listening task particularly difficult and it overworks your ear it overworks your cochlea it overworks it works your inner uh, sorry your middle ear muscles that are involved in uh, the frequency discrimination job uh, one very interesting piece of information I found during my research is that uh, the, co the so-called cochlear amplifier is a function you have inside your cochlea that can act actually act as an amplifier when you have trouble resolving frequencies which means identifying which frequency is being is being heard right now and if you if, and if your spectrum has been manipulated your brain your your ear actually not your brain you will have to perform that a lot now it is done by amplifying the amplifying selected parts of the spectrum and it and the cochlear amplifier which is um, which is activated by outer hair cells can amplify a signal by as much as 50 decibel this is one potential, explana potential explanation of the reason why bad sound can produce similar in injuries that look like, on an audiogram, they look like, like, uh, like loud noise injuries. Because it gets loud inside the cochlea. If it's not clear enough, your cochlea will amplify it. That is one potential explanation. So there is a cocktail of different effects caused by what I call junk sound and people call toxic sound there is a cocktail of effects caused by this junk sound that to me is a perfectly good explanation of the reason why your ears begin to suffer uh, the traditional theory is a quantitative model sound loud sound sound pressure level spikes bad for your ears but poor sound is a qualitative model sound poor sound, not clear enough, a number of reactions in your ear, in your brain, temporal mandibular joint, pressure in your middle ear because you're talking at the same time and that increases and that lowers your acoustic reflex. Um, the cochlea is not working properly, the signal is not properly being distributed, there are lots of feedbacks involving the temporal mandibular joint, uh, cognitive uh, overloads, cognitive fatigue, sensory fatigue, it's not just a matter of cognitive loads, this is a sensory load, an overload. And lots of factors that are feeding a vicious circle. The compressor and limiter solution will remove decibels but it will leave sound poor if it was poor. Okay? So you're back to the cocktail effect at a cocktail party which to me is a nightmare and the only possible solution is go hi-fi um, so um, zoom calls this particular feature music friendly because the one of the key assumptions and one of the key myths we have to debunk is that you do not need high frequencies to understand speech uh, my plea would be uh, my, my, my I mean what um, I pray to God actually that they will be that that they will begin treating us like musicians because uh, that way our ears will not suffer and we will be able to uh, to give our audience a good performance. Now uh, here is a list of myths that I would love uh, Christian to help us debunk. You don't need high frequencies to understand speech. Speech optimization, uh, it's, uh, this, is, this is very fashionable right now. You optimize speech in order to make it easier to understand. This is done a lot uh, in digital sound. Binaural hearing and monooral hearing. Binaural hearing is supposed to have an advantage, but again, uh, if you're using both ears and what you hear is stereo, stereo not double mono. Better headphones will improve the sound you get and maybe I'll buy myself a better PC because that will make 
uh, will, will make the sound I get when I'm doing RSI clearer and better. ISO compliant headsets improve sound. Noise cancelling is what we need when we're working remotely. A little bit of food for thought for my friend Christian. Over to you. Hi, and thanks, Andrea, for giving me the floor. Well, <clears throat> I'll probably have various ideas that I gathered. I have no slides, and I ask people to forgive me if I don't have a clear line, and, but I will try to follow my mind and things I remember. First, um, I was, well, not puzzled, but I was thinking while you were mentioning these acoustic shocks, you said you could gather data if you wanted, even on large scale organizations, just by plugging in um, um, an instrument an instrument to measure uh, dBs. Provided you know the type of headphone, this is feasible because you know the sensitivity of the headphone. But there are a few things that come to mind. If you look, for instance, at the recent AIC study on acoustic shocks, most of them happened in the Western world, especially Italy, Belgium, France, Belgium, Italia, Belgica, Francia. I can hear a Spanish translation on the background. I don't know what has happened, but I heard a Spanish translation on the background. Okay, now it's gone. And I was saying that most of the acoustic shocks apparently according to AIX latest study were reported in civilized countries where most consoles are ISO compliant and already integrate a limiter. This alone and I apologize suggests that problems do not come necessarily from high peaks because these high peaks have been automatically cut by all our consoles we use in the Western world at least um, since the late 90s, maybe slightly later. But in the last 10 or 15 years, for sure, most consoles in large institutions have limiters. This is the first thing that I was um, thinking. And then um, wear and tear has also been suggested and that's why I think it's time to change the myth, so to speak. Even the OSCE and the ISO group basically following acoustic exposure to loud noises in 2014 revised basically their main um, specifications and said clearly that exposure level is important but they want to develop a dosimetric approach. This means that the time you are being exposed is much more important than peaks. That's why I'm saying that peaks are just a small fraction of the problem, if ever they are a problem in the Western world exist. At least I don't want to 
be too presumptuous. Um, acoustic shocks can happen. Uh, some equipment can have issues. For sure, there are some parts of the world where they are more frequent, I would say, and they can happen. But in the Western world, and especially in Europe and France, Belgium, Germany, where most um, respondent to the IEX questionnaire reported their acoustic shocks, honestly, it seems really unlikely. And that's why I think that we should start looking elsewhere. And luckily enough, we have somewhere to look. Because wear and tear is a big issue. And um, though Andrea concentrated more on this than I did, uh, he didn't mention the work of the stapedius muscle and the uh, tensor tympani muscle. Andrea may expand on this a little bit, but even their work is at really it's put under stress by toxic sound and when sound is not complete in the frequency spectrum. Um, maybe I give back the word to Andrea, maybe he wants to say something or a couple of words on these tapedius and the role of the tensor tympani muscle in the middle ear. Then I will come back with the myth debunking. Um, actually, um, I would, I'd rather not do that. I touched upon um, and I told um, our, our viewers that uh, the stapedius and, and tensor, tympan tensor tympani muscles are impedance uh, regulating uh, muscles that um, are both involved in uh, protecting uh, the inner ear from uh, from uh, sudden spikes but they're also involved in the frequency discrimination task so they do both they they both as, act as the bodyguard of the inner ear but also as they also have to perform a very delicate and and um uh, a subtle <clears throat> task of uh, discriminating, discriminating uh, the frequencies, and especially so uh, in the lower end of the range. And if you remember the spectrograms I showed you, RSI sound almost completely concentrates in the one to four, one to five thousand hertz uh, portion of the spectrum. One uh, and the first two thousand, two thousand hertz is where is where the tim tins tensor tympani muscle and the stapedius muscle have to work the most. So we're basically uh, providing a feed that uh, forces uh, the uh, middle ear muscles to uh, to uh, work harder than they should, and uh, and uh, and it throws the entire middle middle ear off its natural balance but i would not add more i mean i've written on the subject and i would i would i, I wouldn't want to keep our listen to bore our listeners to death with with uh, technical uh, and medical details uh, whereas i think you you can you can add a lot to this to this presentation by explaining why uh, post processing is bad for sound because people yes. tend to think that if they re they get background noise removed, they will hear a better feed. They will be okay. better able to understand speech. Yeah, I'll start from there, Andrea. First, <laughs> the interesting thing about the trucks that you mentioned about trucks. Um, well, actually, as a blind person, uh, I think that I couldn't do anything without redundancy because if things were not redundant uh, I wouldn't be here probably. Um, luckily enough many things are redundant and we do need redundant things especially when things get complicated because redundancy helps us to recover what got lost in some sort of situation or for some strange reason. 
and in an RSI setting along the chain there are really a ton of phenomena and things that can happen that a lot of information can get lost. Okay, um, going back to the sound processing. Um, why people tend to think that sound processing, noise cancellation, echo suppression, and there are many more, and, and then marketing strategies uh, find thousands of words with the same meaning, basically. Um, people tend to think that they are a nice thing simply because first they have been marketed a lot, they can be found on any pair of headphones, for instance, that you use with your mobile phone, but there they have a specific task while you are calling someone maybe on the street. And that's the problem. Because calling someone while on the street is a somehow very strange situation that shouldn't happen while interpreting or while listening to a conference. And that's why conference rooms have been treated for years. I mean, Greek populations started treating their theatres more than 2000 years ago. I mean, echo shouldn't exist in the first place in a conference setting then we all know it slightly exists, but something that tries to eliminate echo cannot possibly know what's echo, what's a noise, and what is contained in our voice and can be useful to our listener. Okay, then someone will come and will tell me Oh, but artificial intelligence is able to discriminate frequencies, is able to recognize uh, a sound and generate a counterface sound to compensate for that. True. I mean, we all know that, I mean, I can quote a couple of brands and I take my responsibility. Bose and Bose and Sony make um, fantastic headphones that can be used, for instance, while flying or uh, on the train, but they have specific tasks. And first, they're not conceived for uh, an interpreting task, and they have a specific role. In RSI, what happens when you're cancelling echo? or when you are suppressing the noise, basically you butcher your voice. Something gets arbitrarily subtracted from your voice, removed, and sorry, and um, your feed is degraded. And no way you can recover the sound at the end. Basically, if sound has been butchered by a platform, if frequency range has been reduced, there's nothing you can do to restore good sound at the end of the chain. That was basically the summary of my um, first article. Now, um, a couple of other things. When we consider all these uh, phenomena, we have to keep in mind that headsets... Well, first, let me backtrack for a while. Uh, headsets. Have you ever seen headsets in the broadcasting sector? I mean, I'm blind, maybe I never saw them, but for sure they're not very common. I would say that lavalier mics, good studio mics, broadcasting mics, 
good um, mics that come on top of your head or mics that come simply on the side of your cheek like in a theater-like situation are much more common and headsets are something that I never see in the broadcasting world and for a reason because when you have your headset mic close to your mouth especially if it's on the corner of your mouth you are capturing a lot of unwanted sounds and this is something I wanted to say first but then I have the impression that recently I've seen a lot of things concentrating on interpreters output okay I'm not saying interpreters output is not important of course we have to reach the outside world with a pleasant tone of voice with a pleasant voice but let me debunk a myth I'm using uh, well just a question on the chat how do you hear me what is the impression you get from this sound it's it's a sincere question if someone can reply can you hear me yes well i i read the answers sound seems fine sound uh, naturally to me sounds good it's all right um sound is good absolutely fine clear through okay. the headphones very good so excellent thanks um thanks gabriella for reading them out to me uh, really appreciate it okay now this mic is a ten dollar mic okay this means that almost uh, all mics on the market if well chosen and this doesn't mean according to marketing specs this means well chosen by technically trained people most mics can provide good signal and if something is not heard well on the other part of the end I mean of the conference it's not a mic problem it's a conference um, platform related issue okay um, Andrea can you maybe repeat ah uh, wait wait a second I have a small issue wait a second just a second allow me so maybe maybe we can uh, ask uh, someone whether he or she has a question to ask uh, to Andrea Cagnato just to fill the gap I apologize no. oh, okay. I apologize Great. <laughs> yeah, so okay. we'll have to wait Sorry. for questions yeah, yeah. <laughs> but we'll have time for Q&A's, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> well, but I wanted to ask Andrea to mention a couple of other points and then I will uh, follow because I don't remember what he mentioned, although I could go on randomly, but maybe if he follows then on the, um, on the slide, it's easier. Andrea, are we alive? I was trying to reply uh, ah, okay. to, to, to answer a chat question and, and I <laughs> sorry, sorry, missed sorry, what you said. Fine. What would you like to say? No, I was asking you if you could read the second point. I mentioned... Oh, the, my um, second point. Oh yes, yeah. the, the, the deb or, debunking thing. My computer crashed and I, and I, and I had to leave for oh, a couple of minutes. Okay. So, but nobody so, noticed, Andrea. Uh, okay, no problem. <laughs> so that's that's, good, to know. that's re good to know. Re read them again. So I will skip what I already uh, just a sec. mentioned. Well, um, the headsets, <coughs> the uh, noise cancelling algorithms and so on. I did it. Binaural hearing. Okay, binaural hearing is a slightly more delicate issue, but I will try. Binaural 
hearing makes sense if we have two distinct sources of sound. Basically, it makes sense while we are in an environment where sounds coming from the right hand side and from the left hand side are different because they hit our head and then there's the head transfer function. It's I don't want to go into details because it's really a quite complicated uh, story. But basically, um, binaural listening makes sense if the audio feed is split and it is different left and right. As Andrea said, while we are listening to a conference, since they use mono mics, basically what we are having is a double mono. So binaural listening doesn't make sense from a classical point of view. And to me, it doesn't make too much sense, even if we want to stretch a little bit the concept. Because some say that while listening with two years, there is binaural summation. This means that while listening with one year, you hear a certain sound at a certain level. While listening with two years, a three or six dB increase in the sound happens. Uh, here, literature is very mm, complicated because some say it's six dBs, some say it's ten. Um, it's a complicated thing, but bear in mind that if you listen with two years, you have a slightly higher volume. It's true. The problem is that when while we are interpreting, we are speaking at the same time. And if we cover both ears, basically what happens, we don't have localization, localization cues, especially in the RSI setting where sound is reduced below 12,000 hertz, basically missing the higher part of the spectrum, we tend to increase our voice. Because did you ever try when something is muffled on the phone? Did you realize you talk with a loud voice? Why? Because you perceive that person as distant. This is a natural phenomenon. While we listen, our brain calibrates even the output of our voice. Because if you think someone is a hundred miles away, I mean, you have to increase your tone of voice. Otherwise, someone um, will not hear you. Basically, binaural summation happens, but while interpreting, we tend to increase our voice even further if we close both our voice, uh, our ears, sorry, uh, we don't have two voices, luckily enough. Um, so I'm not really convinced that it could work having both ears covered, even if you introduce um, your voice as a more me function. Basically, you could electronically put your voice into your headset. Some could use it, but honestly, I'm not convinced it will work. And for sure, it will not reduce the chance of acoustic shocks, especially because if you work with both ears covered, if something for some odd reason happens, both your ears then could be screwed. So I wouldn't suggest working with both ears at the same time, but then I realize it's also a personal preference and some opinions might differ. Then, uh, Andrea, what was next?
I'm trying to answer chat questions while you're okay. talking. There was one particularly interesting, I think, for everybody. Tell me. One of our colleagues, someone you know actually, <clears throat> mm -hmm. asked if uh, aggressive echo cancellation is compatible with uh, Hi-Fi. Would you please explain yes. if yeah. it is possible to remove something from a feed no. without deteriorating, no. deteriorating the quality of that feed? No. And could you please uh, explain why? I can be really blunt here. Uh, Hi-Fi, by definition, means something that is as close as possible to the original sound as much as we can. This means that everything that can modify the sound, somehow modify it, will not be hi-fi per se. Now, if you increase trebles, you could also say that it's no longer a hi-fi sound because you increase trebles or you performed equalization or whatever. But this is still possible because you can make up for other components that are along the chain. The chain. I apologize. Um, but when you are using echo suppression algorithms or noise cancelling algorithms, don't think for a while to the algorithms used in headsets, uh, I mean headphones, noise cancelling headphones. That's a completely different story. I don't want to enter into technical details, but even there it's no longer hi-fi. You are removing parts of your speech and these parts will never be restored downstream. Now, if you try to remove a Christian, hiss... Can I, can I ask a question here? Yes. You said uh, they will never be restored downstream. What if I'm working from a hub with sound engineers and so on? No, no, not even there. I mean, if you're working from a hub, your likelihoods are maybe... Your, your, your odds are higher than in a normal setting that both hubs have a well-performing sound channel between them and that, I mean, chances are higher that your original sound reaches the hub. But if the sound that reaches the hub is poor because it has been butchered by the platform, no way sound engineers in the hub can restore good quality to the sound. No hub, no sound engineers, no technicians, no headsets, nothing can restore sound if something has been removed from the original sound. This is a very, I mean, it's a fact. Um, it's not an opinion, <laughs> I can say it loud and clear, it's, it's a fact. And if you try even to remove a hiss from a sound, if the hiss is noticeable, you cannot possibly remove it without butchering the sound. The track will start being metallic with strange noises, artifacts, because nobody, I mean, we didn't mention artifacts a lot, and artifacts um, first, they are annoying because when voice is not natural, we are human beings and being animals, we like natural things. So when something is artificial, our brains start, mm, something is wrong. Um, but that being said, artifacts uh, are spikes of sound, are wave forms and wave shapes that are not natural and even artifacts can be dangerous to our middle and inner ear. Um, I don't know if th there was something else, Andrea, that I s 
maybe I skipped well, there's actually, something. There's actually one thing you skipped. Uh, Tell me. The bit about ISO compliant headsets or microphone and so on. Ah. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting question because there has been a lot of talk about ISO compliant headsets being a solution for poor yeah. sound. Yeah. It, I mean, in your opinion, is, is it the headset or is it the no. platform? No, it, well, if you, if you leave me with one um, answer, it's the platform. If then I can expand a little bit, um, it can be both, to be honest. If the platform um, conveys good audio and good quality audio, then even headsets, or I would prefer to say mics, can ha play a role. Because we all heard that your, I mean, I can quote some brands probably, but your studio mic was definitely better than your webcam mics. And my lovely mic is I mean, much, much better than a webcam mic. But it's not an expensive mic, as I said, and a lot has to do with the right mic, the right positioning, no microphonics, no sounds that are, I mean, for some reason, like touching on the mic or a headset mic uh, rubbing on the face or capturing all of your lips movements um, no about headset specifications uh, maybe i will hurt some sensitivities and uh, um, Christian, without I hope hurting I anyone's sensitivities could we please ask vanda to come in for a second yes Let us hear that's great what yeah that will give me like. yes vanda yes. can you hello. say something Yes, hello, how are you? Uh, your Fine, conference thanks. is very interesting. So, uh, uh, okay, because you cannot say boring presentation, but <laughs> no. it would be better probably. No, no, no. It was very, okay. It, it is very interesting. Okay. Now, you probably heard, I mean, Vanda breathing at the end. Okay, this is not that effect. You probably never heard me breathing like this because the microphone positioning is, is different. Um, Vanda's headset, I suppose, because, well, I must be honest, I know it, it's a very expensive one. It's 10 times my little lovely mic. Mm -hmm. And yet, it doesn't meet ISO requirements. It's not a um, broad spectrum mic. Why? Because marketing specs usually are just marketing jargon. Unfortunately, this is something that affects big brands and not so big brands. Uh, because standards are one part of the equation, but then if you just rely on standard, you don't get the whole picture. Uh, it would be really complicated to explain why, but just to tell you a couple of things. Basically, I will show you maybe with my hands or with something. Um, you can say that, uh, I hope you can see my hands on the, on the webcam. Okay. Uh, you can hear sound from 20 hertz from here to 20,000 hertz here, okay? This is the frequency range. And this is what you declare on most products ISO specification. Even, for instance, on IX recommendation, you just have the frequency response declared, which I must be blunt, doesn't mean anything at all, anything at all, because you go from here to here, but if here your sound strength is 100, and while you reach more than 8 kilohertz, 
your sound is less than 20, you will soon realize that yes, you have a 20, 20,000 hertz headphone, but then when you go beyond 8,000, the frequency response is muted, is completely muted and lower than the previous part of the spectrum. That's why, I mean, frequency response or marketing specs have to be interpreted. Then it is true that some producers, some brands also specify this curve, but not all brands do. And unfortunately, um, what we are dealing with is a very slippery slope. Um, that's why headset specifications don't always tell the truth. Um, I don't know, Andrea, if you had something else in mind. Well, I actually would like to, uh, Wanda, uh, to tell yes. us what, mm -hmm. what she, uh, well, how much that, that headset cost her. If, if that's not a problem for you. No, that's not a problem. I paid 153 euros. Wow. Okay. Uh, where okay. did you find that headset? Was it uh, recommended to you? Yes, it was recommended by a company. Uh, it's Plantronics. And, well, I bought it in Paris. Is it, a USB, is it a USB headset? Yes, USB mm -hmm. headset. Can you hear what it sounds like? 150 yeah. in odds. I mean, Christian is using 25 euros I worth know. of equipment. I know, but I even didn't... less, I would say. Yes. But, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, I was mis. Yeah. Can I inform? But Vanda, what happened to you is is very common, and for many reasons. First, I don't know if you noticed. But Wanda has a very, uh, it, it, her volume is changing, is changing, sometimes it's lower, sometimes it's higher. I don't know if other people noticed it. You know why? This is a software or hardware component inside the headset that's, that is processing sound. If you have a good sound interface, good doesn't mean expensive, no processing is applied to your sound. So what you get is what you would hear if you were close to me. Then okay, I'm not saying my, my words are reaching you as clear as they should be if you were here beside me. Uh, we still have some limitations, but when the platform provides you with the right sound and with the right frequency range, then a good headset, or I would say a good mic, can make a difference, certainly. Okay, can we maybe, because I see uh, there time. are time is still questions. Yes, time is uh, almost over, so maybe we can ask uh, our participants if they have uh, some uh, question to ask uh, or uh, if they would rise, uh, uh, Gabriela, if they would we, like to raise their hand. We, we're Sorry. here, we're available. Yes. Even if people want to come in yes. and ask their questions, I mean, I'm very happy to, to, to answer any yeah, questions, answer even yeah. controversial. I mean, uh, yes. throw, to, throw rotten fruit at us. <laughs> I mean, I mean, you don't agree. <laughs> I, I like people who do not agree with me. Yeah, we like them a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who doesn't agree with them <laughs> should take the floor. Yes. Is like there anyone who would like to ask a question? Um... Yes, okay, there was just qu uh, one question uh, concerning uh, the recordings. We, we are recording uh, the webinar and uh, we'll upload it onto uh, Fit Europe's uh, website. Mm -hmm. um, no question? Well, mm -hmm. Andrea, I think there was another myth you wanted to debunk, was it? Yeah, I think we have a question. 
Yeah, we have some okay. questions also because a lot of people are writing to me, uh, despite mm -hmm. the fact that uh, they have the chance of uh, writing to all participants. So I'll read the questions that are to me, like, um, should I use a noise gate to eliminate dirty noises when on remote? No. Uh, I mean, it's, it's really difficult to give clear-cut answers to all these questions, I will try my best. A noise gate uh, usually eliminates noise below a certain threshold. It is used in professional environments to eliminate a slight hiss or to create silence in certain situations. But I wouldn't say and I would never use it for an RSI setting. It's totally useless and um, the less the better. I mean what I would suggest if I have to be short and clear it's a good lavalier mic, a good sound card and that's it. All effects should be disabled if possibly and this is why I wrote the article that basically says that this is possible in a hub-to-hub -hub situation or in a situation where all participants have extremely high diligence but really they have to be really diligent and according to my experience it's really difficult in a normal setting having people to respect all they should do to have i mean these algorithms turned off it's really difficult and that's why i was basically proposing on my article for most cases a hub to hub situation where technicians can set things in advance, test them in advance, because that's the main problems while working with remote participants, especially in hybrid situations or in a full remote setting. But as I was saying at the very beginning, we have a tendency to concentrate on interpreter's output. Though being important, I would say that first we should have a very good input. See them. Okay. Can I can okay. I try? Okay. Can I come in okay. for a second? Uh, I would like to to provide a spoken reply to one of the uh, questions I'm getting uh, on the chat. Uh, Udo Jorg is saying, I have learned that headsets can be problematic, but all too often people sound better with, their, with headsets than people not using headsets. Well, in my experience, when using the hi-fi function, people wearing headsets are the ones who uh, sound worse. And that is because I, I have come to believe that one of the reasons why uh, people seem to want uh, headsets is that headsets some, somehow simulate a sense of proximity uh, which would normally depend on the presence of uh, high frequency information um, com conveyed conveyed by by um, conveyed by by a good microphone and by a hi-fi situation if i put my microphone here you will get a proximity effect that is because high frequencies travel straight here and they are lost in a matter of a few uh, two or three meters you cannot hear them you can only hear them if uh, the speaker is close to you and one of the things you experience in uh, uh, remote simultaneous interpreting is a, is a, some sort of sound coming from the middle of nowhere the speaker is no you, your brain is unable to locate the speaker and having someone with their microphone here uh, it's also, it, it somehow compensates for this lack of proximity in, in the sound feed. So um, that is the reason why, uh, and then it probably uh, reduces the amount of algorithm work because it picks up more sound 
um, from the speaker and less sound from the background. So algorithms will probably become less aggressive, but they will have to be very aggressive in removing your breath, which normally comes out, comes across as very metallic. You've got these weird sounds and they're very annoying. And some, uh, and your S's, for instance, become very, I mean, they have a cutting edge somehow. And that's very annoying and it's bad for your ears. But, and again, I mean, in a hi-fi setting, like the one we are using right now to broadcast, Christian and I, uh, if I were to, let, let me show you what happens if I put this microphone next to my mouth here. Do you like this? I don't think so. No. But that's yeah. better. I mean, in a conference setting and in a TV setting, nobody, nobody would be wearing a microphone here. Because that's just annoying. I, I've never seen headsets, Andrea, in the seri serious broadcasting industry. Never. I've seen headphones, plenty of headphones. I've seen plenty of mics, but headsets, maybe in some sport events, maybe I don't have enough experience. But other than that, I wouldn't say. I mean, honestly, they usually aren't used and for a reason. Um, uh, Gabriela, I think I've so, I saw a couple of raised hands. Yes, exactly. I wanted to tell Wanda because yes, I'm I sure saw she them. has seen them. Yes, hello, Marcela Nicolau. Yeah. yeah, hello. Hi from Barcelona. Very Hi. interesting talk. Hi. So I would like to ask a question and comment about something that was going on in the chat and that I always wonder about. Andrea, you were saying, and then again, it's not what you use, it's what participants use. Yes. And somebody else was saying, okay, sorry, I'll start my video <laughs> yeah. uh, too. So we see. Okay. Hi. Hi. Hello. Um, Hi. Hello. And uh, somebody else, Agnes Devat, was saying educating participants is a big part of the problem, but most conference organizers don't bother. So I think that um, my question is focused on this point because it seems that the others seem to be the problem. Interpreters have worried about getting good mics, good headsets, or the equipment that we need. But have you thought about a strategy of educating participants? Anything that would work? Any campaign? Um, well, we'll wear a mask in Spain now. It seemed to work. The, the campaign that they've done. No, at the beginning, <laughs> well, we didn't uh, want to, but it worked. But some sort of campaign I, I think, to... I think I I can, the campaign to promote the use of headsets has produced tangible results. Too bad that, in my opinion, that's, that was not a good campaign. So there are ways of educating your, your, um, your speakers. But first and foremost, you have to have a platform that allows hi-fi because there's no point in, in, in using even a good microphone like this. And I was not talking that straight into the microphone earlier on. You should be talking straight into this type of microphone. That is the, one of the reasons why people didn't hear, hear me loud enough. But even using a radio microphone, if the platform is not allowing hi-fi sound, this will sound artificial as well and distorted and, and frequency deprived because the platform act, uh, acts as a frequency limiter. They, they will cancel background noise and so on. So uh, your question is actually very interesting. Uh, interpreters are very concerned about their side of the problem, but interpreters are not the side where the problem lies. There's nothing you can do to improve the quality of your incoming feed. Not, no professional headset, no professional headphones, no 1,000 euro headphones will improve the sound you get. And, well, I, I have a, I'm a voice coach and I, I, and I also do voiceover work. I, my voice is pretty rich. It is believed to be pretty rich. Um, and it has been pretty useful to me in my interpreting career, actually. I've done my fair share of uh, TV jobs, for instance, for exactly that reason, because I sound good on TV. But in this particular setting, I do not necessarily want to ask myself, are my listeners enjoying the full potential of my voice when what comes through my headphones, if what comes through my headphones is annoying, is hurting me, and is not giving me a chance to perform the way I can perform. Um, let me tell you what happened to me, and I published something on, 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 on LinkedIn a couple of days ago. Um, I think it was Monday. 
I, I was translating for very high level listeners, politicians, top, top level politicians. And I was translating a German minister talking from a hub because right now the, the German um, government has, put a, has set up a hub with professional conference microphones professional gear I mean they have stuff I mean they were not using studio gear but they were using professional consoles I mean stuff that can give you very good sound and uh, some of them were decent and that particular minister I had to interpret he had level drops every 10-12 seconds he would speak 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 and then suddenly become dark and go down and then come up again Speak, 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 and then suddenly go disappear again and go and come up again. I had to apologize because I was I was skipping sentences and not being able to make sense of what I heard. So in that particular situation, and it was, believe me, it was not the worst thing that happened to me while working with remote interpretation in a hybrid situation from a professional hub. Okay, we're talking a professional hub here, ISO compliant equipment on both sides of the chain and the platform causing havoc and butchering the signal in between. Now I had to apologize three times because I was, I was, I was not being able to, to, to translate stuff and I think they could hear that. And in, that, in, in this particular case, the way my, my voice sounds to my listeners, which is normally pretty important to me as a voice coach, well, that is not exactly on a front burner. What I'm interested in is in improving the feed I get from my speakers. And there are ways to educate our speakers, but first and foremost, we really have to make our voices heard with platforms because they're not doing it right because they are pushing a business model that will tell our potential users use just whatever you have use whatever you have available your inbuilt microphone your laptop what you need to produce to make a decent sound what I'm using right now and what Christian is using it's 25 euros worth of gear you can buy yes. on Amazon sorry on a, on a, on a huge <laughs> whatever <laughs> yeah, yeah you can buy on the, on the internet Okay, so can I come back for a second? Yeah, and just, just you a second. Let me, me conclude. So, okay, go uh, ahead. It's actually a good question. I want my listeners to hear my voice uh, very well. And and we got a question from Claudia, one uh, one of our colleagues, EU colleagues, Christian, asking you uh, if you can provide information sure. on this on the Blue Yeti microphone. The Blue uh, but Yeti just, just 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 an, just a sec. Uh, to me, uh, what comes first is the quality I get. Then I will bother and I will, and I will be very happy to provide my listeners, listeners with a hi-fi uh, signal that delivers the full potential of my voice even using a studio microphone. I've got the equipment, but what comes first is what comes into my headphone. Okay. Did I, I, I answered your question? Yeah, I think uh, not a hundred percent because still I know that it, what you're saying, if I understood well, is that sometimes it's even if you have the correct equipment, is the problem of the platform? No, is that it's always that. No, it's not sometimes. That's the problem in general. It's the platform, not the, the equipment one. you are using. I understand. No, and I understand. But it's is there a way? Because, for example, I also work uh, teaching uh, mm -hmm. English, and some students work in big companies, and the companies provide the headsets for them because of course they, they work in web conferences even when there's no interpreting and some other companies don't provide this and they don't have a mic they they just don't have it and they won't spend money on it maybe not because they don't have the money because they don't know that it will sound better it will help sell better but sometimes i did a test and it says but why my mic is bad my computer is bad yeah, no it's because, just not suitable so far, well, when That's I'm why I was about, talking about a campaign. It's yeah, like, yeah, but it's very this, difficult, I, I mean, know. But. The hi-fi function is in, 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 uh, uh, in Zoom has always been there for a few weeks. Uh, actually, three, four weeks. This is something completely new. So we really have to change the narrative here and say, look, yeah. what platforms normally deliver is poor sound. Zoom right now is delivering good sound if you tweak the parameters and buy yourself 25 euros worth of equipment. <laughs> and let's... And let's bring pressure to bear with other platforms so that they do the same. Because I'm not working for Zoom. I mean, I'm no, 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 uh, no. not necessarily... 
trying Can to I push say Zoom here, but they, are, they, 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 are, they are the only one doing this right now. I'm done. Otherwise, I will forget them. Um, I don't remember the name of the Spanish colleague from Barcelona. Hello, Marcela. Uh, Argentinian, uh, Marcella. but Barcelona. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank um, you, Christian. Well, your idea of a campaign, I think it's something very interesting. I agree with Andrea first that we should, I mean, raise awareness with platforms, basically, because platforms at the moment butcher sound a lot. Zoo introduced this hi-fi feature in the late, maybe a couple of weeks or maybe more, I don't remember. Beginning of September. Yeah, beginning of September. And to be honest, this is nothing new under the sun. I mean, there were broadcasting platforms who did it very well even before. Uh, Zoom applied it to a very common platform. That's the, the news, basically, because hi-fi quality broadcasting with IP internet uh, protocol, I mean hi-fi over the internet, is something that has been done for, I mean, certainly three or four years now, but even more. Um, but if platforms then give us the quality we need, then I totally agree with you choosing the right uh, microphones and choosing the right headphones is not something we should underestimate. Then how to convince our customers, how to convince clients that we need good microphones and good headphones, it's not an easy task, I think. But there is another thing I wanted to uh, comment on. Um, Andrea mentioned the fact that platforms butcher sound with algorithms like noise suppression algorithms, echo cancelling algorithms, and why do they not introduce a hi-fi function? There is a very simple reason for that. If you choose a low-cost model where everyone can connect from everywhere with every device, because this is the logics that are underpinning most platforms, I would say, including the ones used in huge international organizations. Basically, platforms won't be able to give you hi-fi sound because I will show you in a second if for one second I have the hi-fi feature enabled and for some reason my okay my headset our we headphone it. <laughs> uh, get close to the mic you have a huge Larsen effect and unfortunately more than 80% of people are not compliant that's a huge issue I don't know how to solve it unless people work from professional hubs where everything is well controlled, all the variables of the environment are well controlled. I mean, if I switch on the mic, I have to wear a, he a headphone. While in the booth, if you take an interpreting console, when you switch on the mic, your floor um, loudspeaker is muted, instantly muted. There is no way you can do something wrong. Unfortunately, what platforms want at the moment is having people connecting from wherever and with whatever device. And this is a huge issue to my knowledge. 
Thank you very much. Thank You're you welcome. very much to everybody. I've just tried to activate a hi-fi and it's a question that we were commenting with uh, some friends uh, right now. I'm not sure how to activate it. It is through audio showing meeting uh, option, high fidelity music mode. Is it that? Yes, yes, that's one. But then you also have to select the mic. Uh, there is another tricky thing I uh, cannot tell yeah, you at the moment we, we because it's a visual thing. We might want to organize thing. something practical here. Um, which I was discussing this with Christian, we might want to organize some, a practical session in order to teach and show people what to do and how to do when they want to uh, use the Hi-Fi function and then also to provide uh, advice on the type of gear you can buy with multiple options. There's, just, there's, on, there's not just only one setup that will give you decent sound without ripping you off. Okay. Yes, Ga that, that would be great. Yeah. That would be really great. Gabriela, if you just allow me, I forgot to reply to a question okay. Claudia yes. was asking so we'll on the Blue as, Yeti as the mic. Last question, but uh, sorry, just uh, to let everyone know that uh, we're going to save the chat. So if there are more questions and if uh, Andrea and uh, uh, Christian are uh, willing to, we can send them the questions and uh, they will answer. With pleasure. Okay? We're um, also on LinkedIn. I mean, do get in contact with exactly. us. Yeah, do get in, con get in touch yeah, and then we will we'll see. Yeah, just on the Blue Yeti mic, um, although we are mentioning brands here, but uh, Claudia, Blue Yeti, is not bad per se, is better than the mic I'm using at the moment. Uh, it's not up to the mic Andrea was using. Andrea was using a studio mic. I also own it, but I decided to have a different setup. Um, the Blue Yeti mic is a USB mic with several pickup patterns. And this is very interesting because uh, I didn't mention it before, but microphones are not all born equal. You have omnidirectional mics, basically the shape of the pickup pattern is like a ball, is a spherical shaped pickup pattern. And this means that I'm, if I'm doing, you have no difference in the sound you're hearing. And I was moving my hand from the hand, hand side to the left side to the upper part of my head. Um, then you can have cardioid mics, which have a pickup pattern that is shaped similar to a heart. And there, yes, you have a huge difference because if you speak in front of the mic, your voice is richer, um, you are rejecting sounds coming from the back. So the Blue Yeti has different pickup patterns. It's a good USB mic. It's a little bit overrated, if I have to be honest. Uh, it's a little bit pricey. There are, I would say, better options and slightly cheaper. If I have to give an opinion and an honest one, the Blue Yeti mic is not a bad one. No. Okay, so I think it's nine o'clock and it's time to finish. And um, um, I think the very important conclusion that we can draw is that uh, since every one of us, uh, I think, has already experienced that impression of uh, one's brain and ears frying after a couple of hours, uh, uh, translating um, that uh, we sort of should join forces and not just accept what is being offered uh, just because we have to accept it. So, and uh, in that I think that um, national associations and also federations play a very important role. So, what I can say is that we probably should all join forces and uh, start uh, exerting pressure to have these requirements fulfilled. And is there anything you want to add, Andrea and Christian? No, I'm you fine. Go first. Thanks for hosting <laughs> us first. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much. Well, and, thanks uh, for having us and uh, apologies for not having been able to uh, answer all the questions I got from the chat. I was desperately trying to, to cope, but they, 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 I mean, they keep moving and I was also monitoring the discussion and what Christine was saying, but do get in touch over LinkedIn, no problem. Uh, if you want to ask us questions, we're here, no problem. I mean, I'm sorry if I couldn't manage to answer all of your questions in the chat. And thank you very, very much for having us. Thank you. Oh, so I, thank you I was, to everyone. Vanda? Yes, I was only uh, going to say that Janine Fetz wanted to ask a question, but I don't know if she left already. No, she's here. I can see okay. her. Okay. I don't know if she I still wants... I can see her, but... Uh, I don't think she's going to add anything because Thing, it's probably okay. too late for everyone. Yeah. So have a nice uh, evening, everyone. Annette, is there something you would like to add? Oh, we can't hear you. We cannot hear you. Yeah. Thank you very much to <laughs> Christian and Andrea. Um, very steep learning curve. I'm a translator, not an interpreter, so it's a totally different world. Very interesting. And I look forward to more of this. Thank you very much for, for your time. You're welcome. Okay, thank you. Thank you to everyone. Bye and have Bye. a nice uh, evening. Okay, have a nice on my side, goodbye too. as well. Bye. Bye. Bye.